Yeah. Welcome everyone. Yeah. We are very happy okay. to have you all here. Let me first introduce myself. My name is Liad Mudrik. Um, and I say that I'm terribly excited to be here with you all and with you all. Um, I am a, a, a new researcher at the Bid University in the School of Psychological Sciences in the School of Neuroscience. Um, and today I will be hosting this evening this roundtable discussion with our six distinguished guests, the laureates of the 2015 London Big Prize. Let me introduce them, for those of you who may not know which one is which. Uh, so next to me is Professor Peter Brown, uh, one of the world's great historians of late antiquity. Um, there, is, there will be Jimmy Wells here, if you want to say hello. Um, and Professor David Hausler. Um, who has been one of the leaders of assembling uh, the first draft of the Human Genome Sequence. Um, Professor Alessandro Montelli, the world's leading practitioner of oral history. Um, yeah, very uh, You deserve the title, I think. <laughs> Don't be modest. There are only about three or four. Dr. Cyrus Chokia, sorry. Uh, who has made fundamental contributions to understanding the relations between the structure of proteins and their function, and Professor Michael Waterman, who is Professor of Biological Sciences, Mathematics, and Computer Sciences, if one is not enough, um, and who has led the establishing of bioinformatics as a discipline. As I've said, I'm truly honored to be here with you and to have this evening, and I know that you have all been um, lecturing and meeting students in the academia during the past uh, few days, but tonight, we have asked you to hold a somewhat different event. This evening, we will try to tie together past, present, and future, combine the different expertise of these six renowned figures, and try to understand together how the information revolution of our time influences who we are, how we think, and possibly even the building blocks of our biological existence, our genes. During this evening, we welcome you all, uh, the audience, to present questions for our guests. Uh, our goal is to have an interactive conversation in which we are all participants, and this is also why we chose this beautiful uh, place uh, at the center of Tel Aviv, so we could all feel cozy and at home. <laughs> <laughs> very cozy and very at home. Again? Like beer at the call, I will just try to speak louder and maybe hold the microphone closer to my mouth. Is, is that better now? Okay, good. Um, so we will also hear, by the way, questions sent by the Dan David Postdoctorate and Doctoral uh, Scholarship Awardees, uh, who are also here with us today. Uh, before we begin, I would like to invite Noam Barlevi, the director of Mother 9, which is where we are. Maybe you can explain a little bit about uh, hi everyone, good evening. Uh, welcome to Maza 9, the city center for young adults residents. Um, first of all, uh, I want to uh, thank you uh, for coming on behalf of the mayor of Tel Aviv, Yafo, Juan uh, Huldai, especially on these warm days. Um, no, but really, it's, uh, it's a great honor for us uh, to host you here uh, tonight. Tel Aviv, Yafo, Tel Aviv, Yafo is the youngest city in Israel and one of the youngest in the world. One third of the residents here are between the ages of 18 to 35. And it, uh, actually I can say that the young people are one of the most important forces of this city, but it also creates a very interesting challenge for the city because there's a huge crowd of people who see the world differently. They think differently, they make decisions differently, we actually make decisions differently, um, we communicate differently, and this is why we opened this place three years and a half ago, uh, in order to provide services for young people, and not, not only provide services, but also to develop a new policy for young people in the city of Tel Aviv. Um, I think that the issue that we're going to uh, discuss uh, uh, tonight is very relevant for young people because if you think about it, um, one of the most innovative perceptions that the young generation brought to the world in the last decade or two decades is the idea that information is not something that you, sh 
you should just keep to yourself, but you should uh, share with others. And the sharing of information and improving, uh, 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 actually, yeah, m make it uh, uh, public. Um, it's an amazing tool uh, to create a better society and to change the world. Um, so I'm very excited uh, to, to hear this discussion uh, uh, this evening. I want to thank you uh, very much, uh, Dan David Price and David family, for working together. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, to collaborate with you and wish you all an uh, interesting and joyful evening. Thank you so much. On when you spoke, I was asking myself, what is the age limit to be considered as a young adult? Am I already passed it or not? We don't check IDs on the end. Okay, good. So, so I guess I'm good to go. Um, so we will start with a small round of questions that I will present to you just as a start for our uh, discussion. As I've said, you're all very welcome to uh, contribute questions. Uh, and I would like to start with you, Professor Portelli, uh, because your approach has practically given rise to a new branch of history. Uh, among other things, you focus on the way people remember historical events, and not only on the facts of the events, and you're also very interested in the way people misinterpret or misremember these events. And we're talking today about the information revolution. I wanted to ask you whether you think that in our time, our, our day, where people just obsessively document themselves and leave so many traces behind, Will that improve our historical memory? Will, will that make us make uh, maybe make less errors? Let me know. Well, I have to speak very well. Yeah, honestly, I don't know. Um, <laughs> what I've been thinking about is uh, that what I do has to do with the uh, most uh, well, with the least advanced and most widespread form of communication, which is the form of communication that we're using here tonight, which is the human voice. And, uh, and uh, the human voice has certain characteristics. Number one, it's uh, two ways. Uh, we, are, we are not only hearers, but we're also, we're all speakers. So the question of whether we are creators of information is, the answer is, of course, yes, since human beings began to be able to talk. And that was the first revol information revolution, in fact. Uh, the other thing which I think is relevant to the question of um, uh, information and uh, speech is that orality, the advantages and the limits of orality are that it's bound to time and place. That is, uh, we can talk here and now, but uh, all the previous information revolutions have dealt with the, quest with the problem of making language durable and, uh, uh, and to extend it in, in space so that... Uh, we have a dramatic interest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's not your fault, we know. It's meeting of the Wikipedia community. Very nice. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we were in the middle of Professor Portelli's uh, well, answer. So basically, the, all the what um, has been called the technologies of the word um, are machines that tend to make language permanent and um, able to travel in time and in space. We begin with, you know, chirography, and then printing, and then, uh, you know, all the way to Wikipedia and beyond Wikipedia. But let so, me ask you this, does our way of, so this, uh, this technology change the way we speak as well? Well, it changed um, in this way, which, the fact that we're still using this very obsolete form of communication, which is a voice, uh, means that uh, all the information technologies did not generate a better technology. Uh, that um, progress was not vertical, but horizontal. Uh, that is, at one point, we were able to speak and write, and then speak, write, and print, and speak, write, and telephone. And, so. and this, uh, of course, changed the way we tell stories and the way we remember, because uh, what happens uh, was that um, the, uh, each new technology 
uh, specialized the pre-existing technologies. That is, they were used for what they did better, and, and uh, we delegated to the new technologies the tasks that, like for instance, the task of remembering. Um, we no longer uh, use very much the mnemotechnics of the ancient Greeks that generated generate the epic poetry, generated the classical hexameter, and then uh, you know, each new way, new form of communication of each new uh, technology of the word uh, generated different forms of storytelling. Uh, uh, print generated the novel, and then the novel be was the main form of storytelling until cinema came. And what happened with, when cinema came uh, is not that the novel disappeared, but it became much more specialized, much more uh, self-reflexive, uh, self which is what happened to cinema with television. And I think it's, which is what is happening with television now. So, so we are finding new ways to yeah, tell stories. Each new way uh, makes us uh, able to use the old ways much more effectively. And, um, and so we're all using all forms of technology at the same time. Like uh, yesterday, I was supposed to meet this lady in the hall of the hotel. And she doesn't know me, and I didn't know her. There were three ladies sitting in the hall. I don't know which, which was which. And so I sent her an email <laughs> <laughs> across three meters. And then we sat down, and we talked. And she showed me her book of photographs. And in the end, she took a piece of paper, and she wrote her email address. So within the space of 20 minutes, we had orality, uh, e email, photography, printing, uh, choreography, and uh, all at the same time, which I think is um, what is really happening. We now have our whole <coughs> range of technologies from which we can choose. We're not bound to use the latest, but the latest makes us able to use the oldest much better. But if I understood you correctly, and I want to address this question for you, Professor Brown, what you're saying is that the techniques have changed, but the essence of telling stories, of being human being, is more or less the same. And I wanted to ask you, because you have studied so widely the late antiquity from the second to the eighth uh, century, are we substantially different than the people that live there? OK, we have more technology, we have running water, and we have uh, electricity. But are we substantially different? Are they also, they also, they also have running water? That's a good question. Good thing to learn. OK. Uh, that's that's a very big question. Uh, yeah, of course, sir. Um, my feeling is we may be very different, but our human responsibilities are the same. That is, not only do we have information, we still have to decide how information can be used and should be used. It's not something which the thought that we might jump into a different type of human being will resolve, because that thought, I think, is utopian. I think it would take the break off. It would take the break off. It would make us less aware that there are dangers in the abuse of information, in the flood of information, in the privatization of information. Um, it's good for information to be general, but Think of how many sectarian messages pass unchallenged over the internet, through blogs, through special interest sites, silently. I'm also a man of the voice. I like to hear voices. I like to hear voices raised in anger, in protest, and in persuasion. And if we enter a world of purely silent exchange of information, we also enter with the danger of a highly privatized imaginative world where individuals looking into their computer read what they want to read endlessly and as it were solipsistically. That I don't like. What I love about information revolution is you can retrieve things. Historians, 
we always talk about historians as if there's a past out there and we sort of go there. We, we get ourselves lost like rare pandas in the jungle, <laughs> chewing at rare roots, as if it's out there. But no, it's a constant effort to recapture. And recapture means hard work and often dangerous work. Let me give you one example, simply one example. In my study in late antiquity, everyone assumes that, yes, you know Latin, you know Greek. But if you don't know Syriac and Aramaic, you know only half of the Middle East. They must interrupt you and tell those in the audience that don't know that he knows 15. No, 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 come, come. That's, that's exaggerating. But the reason is that they're out there, and they can easily lie forgotten and they could contribute to our knowledge of ourselves and not just of the past. And they are in constant danger. Syriaca.org is the only bit of information I know about and has done a great job. One of my students started it four years ago. It has added 2,500 hitherto unknown sites between eastern Turkey, northern Iraq, and the Iranian border in a world which had been treated as empty. 2,500. A lot of my students entered northern Iraq wearing bulletproof vests and came out with knowledge of 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th century monasteries of which we had not dreamt. That's something to be proud of. It's also something very important because cultures can be lost. The activities of ISIS, for instance, turning precisely these regions into a cultural dust bowl, this has taken us all chillingly by surprise. That is, historians like to think the past is always there, just as pandas like to think the bamboo is always there, but it, it's a past that has to be constantly retrieved. You can't do it fast enough or more skilled enough, and there we owe everything to my right-hand neighbor who's taught us how to do so. <laughs> Thank you very much. That is at least one precedent where a political a political movement has tried to turn the history of this land into that. That's the uh, Pol Pot's group in uh, Cambodia. Yes. That ran group, but due to a group of two Israelis, some Italians, and a lot of French people, there has been a wouldn't he hope to say a, a partial resurrection, but at least a symbolic resurrection of the things they tried to destroy. And, and, and the late uh, historical process with some of the same uh, traits was done in Afghanistan when, uh, the, when for example, the, uh, the Taliban grew up of the Buddhist factions. I think it was 1940 or something. Yeah, I remember sitting on the head of that Buddha uh, before it was blown up. <laughs> You're absolutely right. It would be a kind of magic setting on its head after it was blown up. Yes, it would. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. The example I cited is central to my own work, but Tibet exists almost in libraries now, not on the ground. Cambodia has gradually brought its memory together. These are really urgent things, and we cannot be thankful enough for any devices which enable this urgent retrieval to take place. Because without knowing it, if we lose a culture, it's like losing a strain of birds. Something will go from the world. I'm 
something that is new in race. Yes. Yeah, and, uh, and I want to continue with Mr. Wells, and we are speaking mm -hmm. about the information revolutions, and I hope that they won't embarrass you by saying that in many ways you are the inform information revolution. And I was wondering, you know, when you started it all, Wikipedia, which has become our closest friend, um, did you think it would go so far? <coughs> well, uh, I mean, the first thing I have to say is it's a uh, a very bad place uh, in life to be speaking after Professor Brown <laughs> because my eloquence isn't so good. But uh, you have me in the middle, so you're <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting to, to tie all this together. So when when I started Wikipedia, there was always this idea of a free encyclopedia for every single person on the planet in their own language. But this was just uh, an idea, uh, more or less in the abstract, and. There were a lot of elements of that that never occurred to me what the implications of that would be uh, in terms of uh, the global scope. I mean, obviously, it's global in scope. But what does that really mean? Uh, it means that I've met people, I've traveled all over the world to meet Wikipedians uh, in, in all kinds of different cultures and so forth. Um, but also, uh, just to speak a little bit to the, to the point that was just being discussed, um, to see something that had never occurred to me, but is obvious once you know it, that um, language preservation um, is an important passion of ordinary people in ordinary communities who, through Wikipedia, have found an avenue uh, to work on this sort of thing, which prior to this, they really didn't have a way of doing it. So you see, for example, uh, one of the strongest communities is the Catalan community. Now, this is a language that's not um, endangered necessarily, but it's a language that was under pressure for a very long time due to Franco, um, and is now uh, enjoying quite a resurgence. Um, and the Catalan Wikipedia community is very passionate about this language. We see it uh, in the Welsh language, uh, one that always uh, brings a, a bit of a smile to people's faces uh, uh, here in Israel is the Yiddish Wikipedia, which people say, oh, that's really amusing people, but there, this is a culture, this is a a group of people who remember this language uh, still speak it at home sometimes, but their grandmother spoke it and so forth. And so the Yiddish Wikipedia is a group of people who are very passionate about this little corner of the world. We have uh, Ladino Wikipedia is another one, a uh, Jewish language that is, uh, you know, uh, very marginal anymore. But this community is very passionate about <coughs> writing things down in their language. Uh, so we see this. Uh, all around the world, and actually another element of this, this is another random thought, but one of our more successful projects in recent years for people who are not a core part of the Wikipedia editing community has been our um, Wiki Loves Monuments uh, photo competition, where we say to people, uh, go and take a photo of some monument uh, where you live, and we've gotten enormous numbers of submissions, some of them quite beautiful, of famous or not so famous, but people with great photography skills, but I actually think the, the great treasure, I mean, I love to look at the most beautiful ones, the winners of the competition are quite beautiful, but for me, the ultimate value of it might not be those ones, uh, the most beautiful pictures of the most famous things, but actually this obscure statue of this obscure person, um, which will probably in 100 years get knocked down and taken away, and it'll be really nice that, you know, you may not think, well, think oh, that's a nice statue, I'll put it out and send to Wikipedia, and you may not think, what, what will this mean to someone? Uh, maybe only the... The, the, the descendants of this uh, local politician, you know, some 200 years later, who can say, aha, this is my great, great, great grandfather. Uh, they made a statue to him. Unfortunately, the only thing I know is the two sentences from Wikipedia, but there he is. Um, and so this idea that, this passion that people have, ordinary people have, for uh, thinking about the past, thinking about their culture and tradition, uh, is a strong urge, a strong feeling, a strong motivation. Um, and so it's very interesting. Where is all this uh, data stored? Um, in Let me just repeat the question for those who work <laughs> yep. us on, uh, ah, yes. on the upper floor. So we, you were asked, where is all the data stored? Yes, we're, there are people watching from an upper floor? Yes. <laughs> like a different room. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Hello, other room. I was once in Saudi Arabia, and I made a, a big protest from stage. I didn't know what was going to happen. I should have known I was going to Saudi Arabia. They said to me, no, 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 don't worry. The women will be able to watch 
They're in the upper floor. <laughs> I hope here it's a similar mix of people. They just didn't get here early. <laughs> we discriminate against people who show up late here, <laughs> not against women. Um, where is it all stored? So we have uh, uh, Wikimedia Commons is where a lot of photo uh, things are stored. The language things I was talking about, um, each will have their own domain, just like Hebrew Wikipedia, English, Spanish Wikipedia. Uh, they'll have their own Welsh Wikipedia is out there. Um, and in terms of physical storage, it's stored on servers, uh, mostly in Virginia. Uh, but we have a backup strategy. Um, and, uh, but even this is something. There's a really fantastic project uh, called the, the Internet Archive, uh, run out of uh, San Francisco, where uh, Brewster Kale, who was an early internet uh, success story, um, has invested a lot of money in basically crawling the web all the time and saving pages, saving pages. And it's an incomplete record uh, that will be somehow archaeology of the future. So let's follow up on that, on that point, and excuse me for uh, leaving a bit longer with Mr. Wells, because one of the questions we received actually through Facebook was from Zeri Garli, is he here? No, so I will ask on his behalf. He wanted to... on the fifth floor. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to ask if we could have another burning down of the Library of Alexandria in a way. So could we have all our data lost, all the Wikipedia knowledge lost, I, I think it would be very, very difficult. I mean, one of the interesting things about Wikipedia is that it's all freely licensed. So that means anyone can, can copy it, modify it, redistribute it. But what it also means is that we make our full database dump uh, fully available. So anyone can come and download the entire database of Wikipedia. Now, it's not trivial to do so on ordinary connection, but that means that all around the world we have our own sort of sort of corporate backup strategy, you might say, where we make sure that things get backed up appropriately. But also, we have copies of Wikipedia that exist on university professor uh, you know, clusters, where people have downloaded all of Wikipedia at a point in time in order to do some research on uh, whatever the data, word counts, uh, community yeah. interactions, all the things that people like to research. So the short, reassuring so, answer is no. I think There's we're okay. No we, won't, we won't lose all of Wikipedia. We might lose a few weeks' work if uh, something goes. But I think it's an interesting question. Because, so for Wikipedia itself, this is, is probably true. But you know, with what Brewster Kale is doing... Um, and, Google, and Google doesn't does and, a lot of backup for... Of course, yes. Google has a, yeah. has a, has a big archive. But so even with Google, like the interesting thing is I, I'm, I'm an admirer of Google as a company. Uh, but. Internet Archive, it is their purpose to be like a, an archive to really sort of keep this, and they keep a copy, uh, interestingly enough, in the library at Alexandria. They have a, a set of servers there if you go there to Alexandria. Uh, and in California, they probably have more than that. But with Google, Google, yes, Google obviously keeps a lot of data, but they, at some point, they may have a commercial reason to uh, delete it. Um, although data, once collected, you know, as long as technology keeps moving forward, it becomes easier and easier, you know, you, yeah. now you can store. I, 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 no, just a second, I just want to have a chance to ask also the three other, yes. uh, um, yeah. and then we, we, we'll come back to you if you still have the question, because, yeah, sure, of course. And of course, a lot of data are stored in our minds, mm -hmm. and as long as we don't lose our minds, <laughs> basic data are, st are safe. No, but then the question is, when we store I may so have a problem data, with this. when we store so much data online on, on, with technology, do we have less data on our minds? That's Another question we should also uh, consider, but I, I want to, the, the prize focuses on past, present, and future, so in to the past and in the present. Now let's go to the final frontier, to the future. Uh, and we all know what Wikipedia is, and most of us know what history is, but I'm guessing that not all of us know what bioinformatics is. So I would like to start uh, with you, Dr. Chodi. Could you give us a, sh a short explanation, Bioinformatics 101? Bioinformatics is, is, is really just a, 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 a simple name for a, for, for a simple product. It means it's, it's talking about, it, 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 it's just helping to describe the, 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 the Language, 
temperature can, 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 can deal, deal with science. Science which, which, which will be, and so really it's, it, it's something which was really, just yes, someone picked up some time ago and started using and it spread very widely. Because no one before that had thought sort of using a language, language of science in a, in a systematic way. So what, what it does is, is it essentially is it, it collects all the, all the words which are in the scientific dictionaries and puts them in the, into a, into a, a central place. Clear to me. Uh, yes, you want to add something? I'd love to add something. I was uh, at a university uh, in, in another country and was uh, asked to say something and develop some policy about bioinformatics. It was a very awkward position because I was some preaching down to them. And I began uh, by looking up bioinformatics on Wikipedia and showed them the definition, and the entire room was laughing. Uh, <laughs> at, at, at this definition, and I managed to to, get, to disarm the audience. So, <laughs> thank, thank you, Jimmy. <laughs> so let me ask you this, though. Um, we are speaking about the genome, the Human Genome Project today, and I know that it was, um, if I remember correctly, announced complete in 2003 or so. Uh, was, uh, it depends on you choose your time. Okay. Uh, again, I think 2000 was the first. The 2001 first draft, yeah. really is. 2000 was the first draft. But we still don't understand. And it's still being. Yeah, yeah, so we still don't understand much of what's going on, don't we? Or, or do we understand it? I just don't understand. Uh, you, you mean understand what's going Function, on so in the genome, yeah. what it's for, and so on? You're, you're, you're certainly right. Um, we, we understand incredibly more than we understood 10 years ago, but we understand really embarrassing little about what's really going on. Uh, so but it, but yeah, it's incredibly explain, exciting. Let's explain again for those who may be less familiar what the Human Genome Project is. Sure. Um, you, uh, your inheritance is from your mother and father. Uh, you have 23 chromosomes. Uh, they're made up, uh, fortunately for being able to describe this, uh, by a sequence of DNA letters, uh, four letter alphabet, three billion of them. That's the story. And so, uh, amazingly, um, we didn't know until 1953, really, that our, gen our genetic code was written in DNA. Um, it wasn't until um, 1995 that the first free living organism was sequenced, and that was a few million letters. And amazingly, we got the, the human genome by the, by the turn of the century, and then things have exploded since then. So what we know today is the, the exact order of the exact sequence, but still don't know, we know quite a bit, but not as much as we wanted about the function. Would that be correct? That, that, that's certainly correct, but you know, if you look around the room, you can't find any two of us who look the same. Uh, so there isn't a human genome. There are human genomes, and uh, my colleague could even talk about a project to try to incorporate uh, all of our variation into um, something like a Wikipedia for the human genome. That, that's, that's his stick. Okay, so maybe you could elaborate on uh, yes. that. <laughs> I, yes, thank I... Thank you for doing my job. Thank you. I, uh, yeah, I was greatly inspired by uh, Professor Brown's comments about saving the past, and uh, I'm thinking in terms of the DNA of the past. Uh, which is another thing we need to save. So, so our, our genomes are, are a product of an amazing process of evolution. Uh, billions of years of evolution for all the life on this planet. And gradually through that, all of the different species have evolved. And we are losing a species at an alarming rate. And when you lose a species, you lose the DNA message that nature took so long to craft, that went so much struggle went into creating that and so many beautiful things are in the DNA that allow the spectacular behavior of all the creatures on this planet. We cannot afford to lose any one of them. We need to preserve 
the animals themselves, but we also need to understand the DNA message that's contained in the animals. One of the mysterious things is that when we, when we look at the human genome, we do see, as Michael said, a great variety of genomes. We're all 99.9% .9 identical, but in three billion bases, that little difference amounts to millions of differences between any two of us. So the human genome is really more than just one genome, and that's true for other populations, so we need to really capture the genetic diversity in every species, not just one representative genome. This becomes incredibly important if the species is about to go extinct because the last few individuals only carry part of that genetic information. You have to breed them very, very carefully in order to preserve the little genetic information that's left in terms of the variants. So we have an enormous opportunity, and it was uh, a great privilege to be part of the Genome Project. Michael was one of the conceivers of the, of the project in a, in, a, in a magnificent meeting in 1985. <laughs> And uh, in Santa Cruz, we had the pleasure of releasing the first human genome onto the internet uh, in the year 2000, actually July 7th, 2000. And so that was a great marriage of the technologies of DNA sequencing, which has been an absolutely revolutionary technology, and the amazing technology of the internet. And you're also, uh, if, if I understood correctly, Establish the practice of sharing genomic information without restriction online. What does that mean exactly? That, that is uh, very important, I think, again, in analogy with different databases of information that you see in other sectors. There is a tendency in the biomedical sector for every hospital or research institution to keep their DNA information to themselves. Uh, there are legitimate reasons for this. One wants to be very careful with patient information. So if I'm the patient of the hospital, I have a right to know what they're going to do with my information. And, and I should be consented if it is going to be shared. But if you take the easy way out and say, well, then we just won't share it, science is enormously disenfranchised and it's blocked outright. If we cannot exchange information about DNA, then we can't understand how differences in the DNA are associated with disease and health. So we will never be able to reap the benefits of the Genome Project if we can't share our DNA with each other. So we cannot take the easy way out. It's very, very important that we work out a method that respects our privacy but still allows us to share our DNA so that we can understand ourselves. Thank you. I want now to uh, have some of the questions that were sent to us by the awardees of the Dana Beast Scholarship. Uh, is Yakil here? No? So let me go straight. Upstairs, probably. So let me go straight to Gali Zurker uh, Baram from Tel Aviv University. She's, by the way, studying modern Yiddish culture, so you can maybe speak about the Wikipedia Yiddish project. Uh, and she focuses on collective writing of memorial books for East European Jewish community. Um, maybe you should okay. give you the mic. So. Uh, well, uh, my question is, uh, do you think that the role of the scholar and scientist in the information age has changed? And if so, how? Thank you. When I, when I began as a graduate student, uh, as a mathematician, um, you know, you work for a few years, you, you create a product that's a few pages, and you send it to a journal, um, which scholars looked very carefully at it, and decided to publish in the journal. And I had no illusion that very many people would read my work, but the idea that it went out around the world forever be in libraries forever moved me very much. And um, I've sort of taken that as my contract that I get uh, paid by both private and public money, but my, but my intellectual products go, go out there and are, are free to, to everyone. Uh, what's changed 
is the speed at which things get moved around and the speed at which the reaction to your work happens. Uh, papers are published on something called Archive X before they're even reviewed, and then there are other people doing research on the, your research. The speed is moved up incredibly. I, I, I find that sometimes tiring. <laughs> and, and, but I used to read my mail, and I would think about it a week, and then maybe answer it. Today, it, 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 it pushes it much faster. But it's really not, not so, so incredibly different. Anyone else has a different idea? I just have one. Um interesting observation that I first made probably five years before starting Wikipedia, so uh, mid-90s when I was on the internet and using the internet, and I came to realize professors are accessible uh, online. They were back then and they still are today. I imagine uh, for any of you, 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 it's probably not that hard to find your email address. <laughs> Anyone can write you. Probably people do. Some of them are probably crazy, so you kind of have to ignore them. <laughs> but yet, if you are a thoughtful person, right, who has a genuine uh, question or inquiry, you can write even some of the most famous professors and say, ah, I've just been studying this thing and I have a question. Uh, and they'll, they're generally very generous with their time. And so that's a, that's a change. I mean, always, Professors have been, in certain ways, uh, accessible to members of the community as wider elders and so forth. But now that community is so much bigger uh, that it causes a lot of spam in your inbox. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's a very large inbox. <laughs> you wanted to ask a few questions? Yeah. Um, I really like the idea of the Wikipedia Archive. So maybe it's not the right moment exactly, but uh, I was. I just wanted to ask one question going back. Jimmy Wales, one question going back to the language uh, issue and sort of turn it around. You have a Wikipedia in Esperanto, which is, you know, of course, a, a, an invented language uh, by a Jewish guy who actually has a street named after him very close to here. <laughs> and um, I just, I was curious about, you know, you said how it's important to preserve the languages and the cultures that are behind them. But I was just curious to ask you, you know, what, what does it, what does it do to your fantasy, to your imagination, this idea of a, a universal language shared by everybody else? And then I wanted to ask Professor Portelli one question, actually a, a suggestion, completely on a different subject. I think it would be very interesting for the people here if they could hear about your project in uh, oral history in Umelfahn, which is very relevant to, to the region and therefore maybe to the people here. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it's very interesting. Uh, one of the interesting things about uh, about Esperanto Wikipedia is that uh, one of the really active members of that community is one of the very, very few native speakers of Esperanto, uh, because his parents were Esperanto enthusiasts, and they they met at an Esperanto convention. This is in the 60s. Yes, the only speaker of the universal language. Uh, and his, I think his mother was French and his father was German and the only language they had in common was Esperanto. He was raised speaking Esperanto. Uh, so he's quite proud of this fact. That, uh, but, um, uh, I mean, the idea of a universal language, I mean, interestingly today, uh, you know, English is the closest thing we have to universal language and I think the Esperanto fans would be happy to point out to you why it's a pretty terrible choice um, given that it's a language that's so difficult to spell and is quite quirky and, and historic in so many ways. Um, but this is what's interesting about Wikipedia is that there, there is, I would say, this big uh, drive, not by anyone in particular, but just by the facts of reality um, for the idea of something like a universal language. People can communicate all around the world and they would like to be able to speak to each other. Uh, you know, English is uh, incredibly important in this regard. But what I see as well is the, that there's the possibility of preserving local languages because the technology also allows uh, you know, documentation, discussion, and so forth in the local languages. So, um, I mean, for me, I think uh, it's, it's great to have um, a bit of both. Uh, and as speaking as an American, we, we don't have a bit of both. We are mostly uh, English speakers and are terrible at other languages. Uh, but I really love uh, places where the local language is vibrant and healthy, and yet there's also a strong push to you know, learn uh, a broader language. 
Well, uh, it's not really my project. It's a project of the community in Umalfan, and I've been privileged to give a little help there. Uh, the um, uh, art gallery in uh, Umalfan is uh, a vibrant center of uh, Palestinian Arab Israeli culture, and uh, and they uh, and uh, it's truly a multimedia. Uh, institution where they, they use visual arts, they use photography, and <coughs> uh, most recently they have been interested in uh, uh, retrieving the memory of the community through oral history and through music. And uh, all that I've been able to do is try to um, help some people learn how to do this. Because of course I can't do it myself because I don't have the language yet. But um, by trying to uh, train local people to uh, save that past. And I think it's very important because saving that past has a powerful impact on the present, on the fact that, uh, well, uh, it's really uh, a much more complex representation of what the country of Israel is today when, uh, when we begin to include those memories, when we begin to include those people, and, uh, and their claim to full citizenship in this country as Palestinian Israelis, uh, with their histories, with their memories. And uh, I'm fascinated by this, by the, uh, by the sense that, uh, well, there, there's a difference that wants to remain a difference in dialogue. And of course, you can only have dialogue if there's a difference. And uh, otherwise, it's just a, a, a monotone of uh, monologues. So, uh, and in fact, I'm meeting with them tomorrow and I'm hoping to continue this conversation. And I hope that they get as much support as possible from all the institutions in the uh, in the country because they're precious for um, a sense of a vibrant, diverse community that, that creates a vibrantly diverse country, and uh, which is so different from the image that is being projected to the rest of the world. And it's so much more attractive in many ways. Thank you very much. It was indeed fascinating. Thank you for asking this question. Just a minute, there's a technical problem. Mr. Wales is getting a shower. Oh, wow. Yes. Uh, oh, it's wow. really wonderful. If only more cold water will fall, I'll be very happy. Okay, so I hope that someone could fix that or have you turn off the, the, uh, the flow. But uh, I have a question from the upstairs. Let me represent those who can only hear us uh, from there. So Guy Harel wants to know if there is a way to make Wikipedia an academic source that can be used in higher education institutes because now it can only be used for general knowledge. Did you, were you contacted about that or is that a valid option? Or? I, well, I get this question almost every day. <laughs> um, but the interesting thing is that this is not a goal that we really have. Um, so when I was at university, uh, if I were to cite Encyclopedia Britannica as a source in a paper, this would not be regarded very well. Not because of quality issues, but because at the university level, uh, reading something in an encyclopedia and writing about it is a, it's not enough. Uh, the purpose of the encyclopedia and the research process is to help you get oriented in an area. You, you come to some area. Or another example I like to give is uh, if you imagine that you're assigned to read a novel about World War II, and there's a scene or something about the Battle of the Bulge, and you think, oh yeah, Battle of the Bulge, I kind of remember that. So you go and you read the entry, which is actually a very nice entry, by the way, about this uh, famous uh, time in the war, and you understand the strategic things and the things that the soldiers were facing. Now you go back to your novel with a richer understanding of the overall context, but there's nothing there to cite. I mean, you just got some background knowledge. So this is a separate question from question of quality, where we do want to have the highest possible quality, uh, but we're not aiming to be uh, a citable source. Now, for younger students, it's different. I mean, I think if someone is if someone is 12 years old, 
and they wrote a paper and they quoted something and added a footnote, let's just celebrate, you know? <laughs> Progress has been made. Um, but once you get to the university level, uh, it's a different story. Hey, I have now a question uh, from uh, Abdel Qadir Asi from the Ben Gurion University. He is also, by the way, highly innovative in his work because he is pursuing the future of the past, as he calls it, by developing computer algorithms aimed at automatically processing historical archives. So he's going to win two prizes. <laughs> What's your baby? Uh, his <laughs> okay, so thank you for this interesting discussion. So thank you for this interesting discussion. I would like also to uh, utilize this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Alessandro Portel for his part in the Omel Fahim project. As I am Palestinian, this is really touching uh, me personally. Uh, my question, uh, I'm quoting Professor Stephen Hawking. Uh, artificial intelligence could end human race. Can we rely on the information revolution to re-engineer organic intelligence in such a way that will prevent the supremacy of artificial intelligence? <laughs> it's up to you to answer the bioinformatics <laughs> <laughs> I always say that when the killer robots come, you'll have me to thank for their fine knowledge of Elizabethan poetry, <laughs> as they will have read Wikipedia. So, so let me ask you this then, if, if, if this question is, is too hard to answer at this point. I, okay. I think that was the answer. <laughs> uh, so I have another question from upstairs, which I think is directly uh, relevant to your work as well. Tomel Ze'ev uh, is asking, would it be possible to create a database, database of sequenced genomes of every human being on this planet and make it publicly available? It, uh, in the near future, would be technically possible to do so. Uh, in the near future? Yes, absolutely. We have the computer technology now to store a version uh, of, of a large number of genomes, and if you look at the rate at which that technology is expanding, we will be able to store a representation of everybody's genome, in theory, so technically capable of sequencing and uh, storing that information. We're not there yet, but it won't be that many years before that becomes a possibility. Now, I think uh, there are, there are a number of reasons why it would be a bad idea to have a centralized database of everybody's genome, who controls it, who owns it, who, yes, so I, I, you know, I think there are a number of, of social issues that run very deep in that concept. So I think we, we need to main control, maintain control of our genetic data and share it through a, a consented procedure where we uh, are participants, active thinking participants in this. They want to ask you, Professor Brown, you know, oh, you have, sorry. So, somebody had, uh, like everything else with human beings, there are people who were, are paranoid about anybody finding out anything about them. And our, our genius friend, George Church at Harvard, has his genome completely sequenced online. You can go to his website, pass a test in genetics, uh, you can have your genome sequenced and be publicly available. And, this, I, and it, the point I think he's making is, so it's publicly available. So what? He, you know, so there's a wide range of acceptability, but, but it's clearly good. not everyone's not going to buy into this, but, but it's from zero to 100%. You see, there's another question. Uh, to, so let me first give an opportunity to those who, who didn't have the chance to ask it. But how would we get the mic? Just I, ask. I speak like that. Okay. Um, so there is like some line that is connecting all of the things that you are talking about, and I think that all of this information is actually not being told as stories uh, over the internet. So it's all kind of anecdotes that are spread out there. If it's history or if it's the DNA, um, so we can't keep a track of everything. And I'm also a biologist, and when you try to keep track of what's happening in the scientific world. It's really hard, there are like hundreds, or, or not hundreds, thousands of papers being published every day, and it's really hard to get a perception of what's going on. 
So do you think there is a way that, that stories can be told back again and that there is another way to process the information and to hand it out to people so we can really make the connections and understand what's going on out there? So if, for example, if I read different um, articles from Wikipedia about London and about some kings in London and some other stuff, it would be hard for me to make a story out of it, right? Let, let, me just repeat, let me just repeat the question for those upstairs. So the question is, if I understood you correctly, is that we have so much information. We have a huge amount of information, and it seems as if it's discreted and not put together into one coherent story, which makes it quite hard for us to follow and understand. And the question was, do we have ways to reorganize these bits and pieces of information into more coherent stories? <coughs> That means we don't. <laughs> okay, and that answers your question. <laughs> I mean, uh, the the one thing that occurs to me is, I do think that we live in an era where uh, cross disciplinary studies um, are much more possible. Uh, you know, the the top people in different fields can reach out to top people in different fields and communicate and collaborate in new ways, which does mean there's an opportunity to sort of move away. We've, we've had this long era of uh, intense uh, specialization in academia, which has incredible benefits because you can go a long way on a narrow path. But then to tie all that back together is also valuable. Uh, and we can do that um, maybe a little better than we could 40 years ago, where it was very difficult to sort of collaborate with somebody 500 miles away. I'll, I'll add to that on the biology side. It is possible to help by reorganize, reorganizing information that is published in biological journal papers in a new format that is, uh, brings pieces of information together that were actually published in separate uh, locations. So we do that with the genome browser, for example, at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, we take the one uh, reference copy of the human genome and any time there's an article published about a piece of the human genome, we put a link on that. And so uh, that reorganizes information relative to the coordinates of the genes in the human genome. And uh, there are actually then uh, thousands of tracts of different types of information that have been added from people all over the world uh, that give other information about that gene, much of it not even published. So that they may have run an experiment throughout the whole genome and found a certain signal in different places and those signals will appear on a track of information that they provide even if it isn't published. So it does reorganize things and it reaches beyond the narrow limitations of the publication strategy. So in that sense there are ways to get beyond that. Uh, I was just reminded of a famous story by uh, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, the, the emperor's uh, map makers, when the emperor asks uh, all his geographers to uh, draw the most accurate, perfect map of the empire, and the map is so accurate that it covers the empire. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and this I think is what, is what is happening. And then, so you need a map in order to navigate the map. And this is, uh, I think, what we're talking about, how, uh, creating maps, creating ways of sifting the information, uh, and uh, ultimately creating some kind of critical uh, awareness of, uh, that allows us to navigate in the different types of information that we have. So you want to at least point to ask, oh sorry. Just quickly, you notice that Google Maps doesn't have that problem because they have this beautiful notion of zooming out and zooming in, right? So you can present things at higher levels of abstraction. We do the same thing on the browser as well, by the way. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, Professor Brown, I'm thinking about the historians of 100, 200 years from now, who will be the ones who have all these or this huge, huge amount of information that was described here, would that be just too much to take in? Historians always find they're dealing with too much. <laughs> <laughs> I can't predict the appetites of my colleagues in 200 years' time. <laughs> what I think is very important is that we always know 
that there'll be more out there than we can observe, ob um, absorb and make our own. I think it's simply a narcissistic fantasy to think that we will ever reach a stage where knowledge will not be beyond us. And therefore, what one hopes for one's colleagues in 200 years is that they will have a hunger for what they don't know. I think we're always, we're, our arguments so far have been very much based on the notion of the satisfaction of needs. And that's a very good thing, and we're within sight of immense satisfaction of these needs. But hunger is also important. Anyone who's lived in societies of reduced books, anyone who's lived in society of constricted thought knows what hunger is. And it would be lovely if somebody could invent a hunger machine, <laughs> but until then, I hope my colleagues in 200 years' time would be equally burdened as I am. We would doubtless curse our administrative duties, our students, everything that takes us away from this wonderful colleaguing with the past. And whether it's past the size of the map of China or just a few shelves of the Patrologia Latina, it's still past, it's out there, it's difficult, and you have a hunger to understand it. Yeah, you spoke about the, the future researchers in, in uh, 200 years ago, but. Uh, but I want to ask about our point of view. Why do we? Are, why are we so obsessed with recording everything, with having every line of some, I don't know, some child writes on his Facebook recorded? Isn't it a flood of information that is not really useful? Yeah, I mean, most everything I read on Facebook is not really useful. It's an enormous waste of my time. But I, all I was just thinking as you were as you were speaking, uh, there's been this sort of idea of who was the last who was the last person to know everything, and different people have been put forward: uh, Goethe, Aristotle. Sort of when when was the last person who could really encompass all human knowledge, uh, and and who could who could write it all down? Now, actually, Wikipedia grows faster than you can read. So you, no one can ever read all of Wikipedia. I mean, you could freeze it at a time and it, it would take you longer than your lifespan to read it. But no matter how long you live, you couldn't read Wikipedia as long as it keeps being written in the way that it is. So this should dash anyone's hopes of thinking we'll ever know everything. Um, my question is also for Professor Brown. Um, um, years ago, one of the winners of the Dundas Deep Prize was an American writer called Neon Byzantine, who later wrote uh, an essay about uh, the dangers that he thought that were looming uh, about uh, humanities in academia. That academia is trending towards uh, science, the study of science, and everything that is uh, quantifiable. And I was wondering whether you agree that that threat exists, and if so, how to deal with it. Um, in the ancient world, philosophers were always regarded with both admiration and contempt. <laughs> I think humanists nowadays are not unlike philosophers in the ancient world. They do, for some reason, have a halo. Whether they deserve it or not, a lot of people don't think they do. We've got to tough it out. <laughs> and I do think that predictive utterances about the fate of the humanities are counterproductive. We have a lot to give still. That's what we have to wave the flag for. And simply to adopt, to go into sage mode and almost enjoy the decline of the humanities in deploring it is a betrayal. 
Uh, let us present one more question from our uh, scholar winners, and then I will go to the other questions from the crowd. Uh, crowd. Zohar Tzafril from Tel Aviv University. He's studying mRNA and gene expression uh, stages, so very relevant to your work. Thank you. Uh, well, my question is related to the present and uh, the future. So uh, both human evolution and technology are examples of processes that accelerate themselves. How far are we from a world uh, where it, would, it will be possible for people to have, uh, for example, cybernetic influence, maybe upload the uh, uh, mind into the cloud, or modify their own gene? And, and how this will affect uh, human evolution? Will, uh, will, will be, can we still be able to call them human? Uh, how, uh, how it will affect our evolution? <laughs> yes. No. Uh, you know, th these are these are deep questions. I, I'll, I'll avoid the artificial intelligence parts of it, but address the genetic parts of it. Uh, so we, many of us are aware. You've read the, the newspapers and and the scientific accounts, perhaps, uh, that we are getting better at editing genomes. Everyone is certainly aware that we are getting better at reading genomes. Uh, better to the point where we can tell you something about the genome of your unborn child, right? So this is prenatal testing, which is very, very fast growing field. Uh, so those, you know, putting those two together, one uh, immediately sees that we need to have a debate right now, society, about how much editing or affecting we want to do on our human genome. How much do we want to take control of our own, our own genetic evolution? Now, we, we've done this already in many ways by altering the equations of survival and survival of the fittest and all of the Darwinian rules. Uh, but uh, this, the changes that we have done so far are we're operating on a very a very long time scale compared to the changes that we will be able to make on a very short time scale in the next few decades. So I, I, it's very important that we all have to ask this question. We can, we can think about it here in a context. So you uh, have just gotten married and you and your mate are both Tay-Sachs carriers. That means you have one broken copy of the gene hex A and you have one functional copy of the gene hex A. Now we don't have to worry about what hex A does, but the point is of Tay-Sachs is that if you get two broken copies, if you get a broken copy from mom and dad, you have a very horrible condition. So suppose now that you have a fertilized egg produced by your husband's sperm, uh, and you need to make a decision about that fertilized egg. Uh, am I going to implant it and have the child or not? So this is a case where you are taking control of this decision because you've chosen to have that fertilized egg externally in some sense where we can look at it and think about its genome. So if the fertilized egg has two copies of the broken hex A gene, then, and you absolutely do not want to have a Tay-Sachs child, you can discard that, which is a living thing in some people's book. Others would say it's not really a, a living person yet, and try again. Or you could edit it, possibly. Now this possibility does not exist today. But there is no reason to believe that it will not exist in the future. It's a four base change to this, to take one copy of it and make it an unbroken gene. Now, why wouldn't we want to get rid of this gene, this broken version in our population altogether? So it's never really a problem. Turns out that there is some evidence that having one broken copy and one good copy might actually be good. It might confer some resistance to tuberculosis. So that might be a rather radical approach that we say we are going to banish all versions of the Tay-Sachs gene from the human population forever. 
but there is still a very important discussion about, well, suppose we do want to maintain diversity. So we want to keep carriers in the population, but we want to edit so that those carriers never reproduce in such a way that they produce a, what's called a homozygote, a copy with two broken versions of the gene. Then we will have to edit, then we will have to engineer. Is that a slippery slope? I think most people are very worried that this is a slippery slope, as rational as that plan might be. So we all have to think about it. And I love that I'm talking at the youth center because I'm really talking to you youth. You are the ones that are going to change the world in how you make your reproductive choices. You have an enormous responsibility at this point. You will change the world forever in your reproductive choices. You will have more reproductive choices than were ever available to anybody before you. So you, more than anybody else, have to have this debate and debate now. We should say at this point that, to my knowledge at least, Israel is the leading country in free uh, prenatal testing and genetic uh, testing uh, and decisions like that. Not editing, of course, but testing. Uh, it seems to me that what's being said assumes that you can know have some influence some, some influence on the on the gene or your looking at but then it's not true because you just don't know how genes o operate together in in any organism so what they would be doing was just be just playing in, 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 in around with things in a, in a way which, which which could be disastrous and they had, and, it, and probably would have very little chance of success so I thought that at the moment that we cannot see how to look at proteins in that way. So we still have a long way to go, and even then we may not know what would be the consequences of, of the changes and edits that we do. It's, the important point is that, that unlike the Tay-Sachs case, most edits, we would not have any clue what they would do. And I'm convinced you don't know everything about the Tay Sachs edits either. And we don't, of course. Right. And so really these are very as you said, very slippery slopes and we're already we're already over over that hump. So this is and it's a societal decision. This is not a scientist decision. This is something that society has to has to come to a conclusion about. I think it's a uh, some in connection to what you were saying. Um, I want to go to what Professor Kurzweil is trying to say, that in 30, 40 years, uh, we will have uh, maybe even the human the Homo sapiens will not exist anymore, <laughs> or uh, we'll have uh, either full uh, carbohydrate uh, bodies, or we'll have uh, silicon bodies, <laughs> or anywhere in between. So I would love to hear some view from, from you about uh, in, in his field, how it will affect us in the future. And the other part of the question is, uh, what's happening to our brain in the last 50 or more years with all this vast uh, speed and amount of information? I'm talking about in the biological life. I mean, what's going on with the brain, which was totally different from uh, the same as it was like 200, 300 years ago, and how it will affect us in the future? I can see we're not going to get away with this <laughs> cybernetic future. Uh, this, we are this, this is really the third time we've got this question. Uh, yeah, well, uh, okay, so um, one of the things that biology teaches us that is most fundamental is that diversity is a good thing. The worst thing you can do for a species population is to eliminate the diversity. Uh, so. That lesson has to be taken at heart. And I don't think there's a future where there is some perfect cyborg that will be better than a diverse population. So let me, let me just put that out there. 
if, you, if we imagine that years in the future we have very intelligent, very rational people, then they will make the rational choice of maintaining diversity. <laughs> so that I'm less worried about the uniform, the, this, the traditional Hollywood sci-fi version of this. Um, because we know, we, we, we have wisdom, we, we're not going to lose that wisdom. So, but whether you want, there are other sci-fi images, and I always go back to the image of the bar scene in Star Wars, the original, everybody seen, I see lots of head nodding, the original Star Wars movie, the bar scene. So, when people say, oh, everybody is going to edit to the perfect genome, they're all going to want to have a genome like their movie star heroes and, and will all look the same, I would say it's more likely if they edited genomes, it, it would look more like the Star Wars <laughs> bar scene, right? And if you look at, you know, people like to have green hair and, you know, it, it, so forth. So, so it, if, we, if we started going in one direction, it may actually increase diversity and our relationships between silicon devices may also become more diverse and create more diversity. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a, um, a, an absolute decision to uniformly replace what we've got with something uniform. Uh, but we have limited resources and so, uh, you know, we don't want to be we, we want our diversity to, to be maintained and not to be eclipsed. And I'm very much uh, in line with that. I, I, I don't, I'm not a Luddite. I don't want to shun all for future technological advances for fear that they will eclipse us. But nevertheless, I would like to make sure we aren't eclipsed. Okay, so in this optimi optimistic uh, uh, line of thought, I want to uh, have our next scholarship winner, Leo Zalmanson from Tel Aviv University, who studies social media and focuses on the effect of social participation on subsequent economic behavior. It's only a bold thing that I read from a smartphone. Um, is the informational revolution inherently open and free? As in the technology activist's uh, famous saying goes, information wants to be free. Well, are we bound to see big companies, rich individuals, and government agencies win the battle of control and regulation in the long run? So, uh, one of the things, uh, so Stuart Brand was the originator of this uh, famous uh, statement, information wants to be free, but he always complains that people forgot the second half of what he said which is information wants to be free and information wants to be expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and his point is that there is this inherent tension between the fact that once uh, created, once put into digital form in particular, uh, but even in older, in book form or whatever, it's quite easy to reproduce and, and therefore cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. But it doesn't necessarily make it any cheaper to create it in the first place. Um, so, you know, uh, his, his next book, uh, could be distributed to everyone on the planet for free, but it doesn't make it any less expensive for him to create it. Right. Uh, but if we're talking about free as in speech, not necessarily as Yeah, yeah, so, but the connection here is that I don't think, I think there's, there are inherent tensions that run in both directions, that, um, you know, it becomes really um, quite economical to run the fifth most popular website for only about $50 million a year, uh, we could do it even cheaper than that if we stopped doing sort of pilot programs and things like that. Um, which means that, yeah, it seems like things can be for me for quite a long time. At the same time, of course, we have these the economic pressures and the sort of uh, different things that are going on. So I don't think there is a, I don't think we're going to go in either direction all the way to the edge. The, the, the counterbalancing uh, mechanisms will be there. And so newspapers, just as one example, uh, online newspapers, have been recently, I'd say, swinging in the direction of more and more behind paywalls, and yet at the same time, just to give two examples, The Guardian and The Daily Mail are doing very, very well by being open because some of their competitors have dropped behind a paywall, and so this balance will always be there, I think. And so I'm not particularly worried that we're going to go all in one direction or another. There are pieces of the internet that I think we should worry about, choke points. Um, you know, people talk a lot about net neutrality. I'm actually more worried about uh, the app store model where every single app 
on, and it's not just Apple, on your, on your Android phone or your Apple phone, comes from the store of the company that controls the platform. Uh, and they take a huge chunk out of it, and they get to decide what's on there. This is, you can imagine the outcry we would have had in 1994 if Apple, if Microsoft had announced from now on every software that will run on a Microsoft computer has to be vetted and approved by Microsoft, and we're going to be willing to say no for competitive reasons, and yet somehow we all love our Apple phones, and that's exactly the situation we're in. It's a big concern. There was such, there was just, just, just a second, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to stop you because we are running out of time and I have, we have a few more questions and I wanted to, I, maybe if we have more time we'll get back to you, but I wanted to ask you, uh, Professor Portelli, in that respect, do you see that when you hear stories, uh, we heard the question about um, whether information is being governed by the wealthy and the powerful, so when you hear stories told by simple people every day, People, do you see the way that powerful uh, agents maybe find their way into modifying the way we perceive reality and history? Do you see that kind of monopoly of, of knowledge? Well, uh, in the first place, uh, diversity is good for biology and diversity is good for culture. And one of the great things about uh, oral history is each person has a different story. And uh, each story, it, I think <coughs> every story we tell, but it isn't just today, um, is a contested ground between, um, well, between what we produce and what we receive. Uh, I'd say in, in the, in the Middle Ages, it would probably be very difficult to tell a story that was not influenced by the dominant Christian narrative. And today, probably, it's very difficult to tell a story that was not influenced by the dominant national narrative. Uh, we had very interesting examples in the, in the workshop with the students this afternoon, in which the same story was both uh, um, worked so that it would fit with the official national narrative, but then it, it couldn't because the actual experience was, uh, could not be reduced to that. So uh, I believe that uh, as we get more ways of, uh, of uh, technologizing language, Storytelling will become much more precious and, in a way, much more um, independent than it has been so far. Precisely because it's less, uh, uh, it's increasingly less authorized. Uh, telling a story is uh, increasingly, uh, speaking up, is increasingly become a violation of the dominant setup. Uh, political and cultural, so that uh, I believe you know, simply by opening up our mouths, uh, we will uh, be uh, well, we'll be limiting the uh, the reach of uh, hegemonic power just just by being able to speak. We are all optimistic today. We have one last question for um, our these. Excuse me, Chai Eitan Cohen Liana Roja. I hope that I pronounced it correctly. He's from Tel Aviv University as well. He's studying the socialization and indoctrination of other Turkism in the Turkish education system. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, evening. Yeah. My question is: Does the transparency that is achieved as a result of the of the penetration? Of, inter, uh, of information technologies into the each sphere in a state <coughs> make democracies weaker, or in other words, make governance harder due to, due, due to growing public criticism. Thank you. I may just. Uh, echo something that um, we've been discussing in a different context that 
uh, diversity is valuable. And so I think that uh, you know, information technology um, allowing for a diversity of voices is something to be celebrated and encouraged and is uh, good for democracy. Uh, so that, of course, uh, there is a certain point at which we also need to arrive at some kind of a consensus uh, in order to make decisions as societies that move forward. Uh, but I think we can have both consensus and diversity as long as there's a, a sort of a general understanding to, uh, as we say, disagree and commit. You know, I don't, I don't riot because my guy didn't win the election, but I double down my efforts to explain to others why they should have voted the other way. So. I'm quoting from uh, from Sting, the rock singer. So much, too much information running into my brain. Too much information driving me insane. <laughs> and what I think we need is some kind of firewall uh, that will enable us to sift the information that's being channeled through our brain, and of course also to use our brain to send it back in all possible ways. And I think. Uh, Ultimately, uh, uh, the fact that we all have speech is the basis of, uh, of freedom and democracy. Uh, the basic right in democracy is freedom of speech, and not just freedom of being spoken to. And I think uh, that uh, fighting for that right is the, uh, is the most important information revolution that we can think of right now. I think at that point um, we are very close to finishing. I want to thank you all and I want to say that, first of all, for me the most uh, inspiring thing was usually they say that you have to be young to be hopeful and to be, I don't know to say naive, but to be optimistic. And the fact that I'm sitting next to such distinguished people who are so optimistic about our future is truly inspiring. I want to thank you all for the wonderful intellectual experience that you gave all of us. I apologize for those who didn't have the chance to ask their questions, but we're just running out of uh, out of time. And just uh, thank you, thank you very much for being here.